Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland Love every racing moment Visit hri.ie And you're very welcome along to this week's edition of Friday Night Racing Brought to you in association with Horse Racing Ireland Love every racing moment Visit hri.ie or follow the Twitter account at hri racing and of course the hashtag is every racing moment Johnny Ward, good afternoon to you, how are you? I'm good, Ger, how are you? Yeah, good, what's your racing week been like so far? It's been pretty quiet. Obviously, we had a um, couple of uh, meetings that were sort of rescheduled for Ireland. Um, and it's been a busy enough week, I suppose, as the week has developed. And two meetings today in Avon into Dundalk. Uh, I think Fairy House is a really excellent card tomorrow. And obviously, with um, Cheltenham having been called off, which is rather unfortunate given, um, you know, they've had Frost and so forth calling off meetings. But it's actually waterlogged at Cheltenham. And that going into the doubts about the, the festival in March in terms of, you know, what that will uh, look like. Um, to trying times for Cheltenham, it must be said. But, uh, yeah, the Irish meet uh, at Ferry House definitely kind of compensates to some extent. And uh, really good mares, novice hurdle, uh, the likes of Roy Cahala running in that. So, um, yeah, plenty to look forward to in these trying times. Was it a classic renewal of the Thaestes this week? Um, it was The ground was really testing at Gorn, um, really, really testing. And... Um, that that was very very obvious from the as the hurdle races went on it became like horses were like and you're talking about hot favourites they're literally just stopping to walk three or four out um, and I'd spoken to Eddie Scally the race course manager on Wednesday night and he, he did say this is going to be really tough so it put stamina at a real premium in the Thais days um, but it was no problem to Coco Beach who essentially was up in the van which you probably kind of needed to be to an extent and travelled like an absolute dream really um, and won the race well for Jack Kennedy and in fairness to Jack he's had horrific luck with injuries so I don't think anyone could begrudge him a big race success but it is all a bit strange still Jerry you know it's just the, the, the Tiesta is really is um, you know if, if James Connolly said Ireland without the Irish means nothing to me um, race meetings without a crowd it's its just strange and you know I I wonder, um, you know, I, I was actually writing a piece earlier. I wonder that some of the mayors that may or may not go for the mayors and officer at Cheltenham, Cheltenham, um, and they're having their sort of prep tomorrow. I wonder, is it is it the be all and end all that it would be in other years if there isn't a crowd there in March? Because that's what it's all about ultimately, I guess. All right, let's uh, do our competition this week before we get to our guest. It's another sweet prize for you. The Dublin Racing Festival obviously goes to post next Saturday and Sunday at Leopardstown. Obviously, you can't be there because racing is still behind closed doors. But the good people at Leopardstown want to bring a flavour of Dublin to your home with the race and graze tasting menu so you'll be able to enjoy a weekend of world-class racing with this delicious sharing menu which will be delivered directly to your door it includes dublin coddle beef and guinness stew dublin cheese potato boxty glen valley buttermilk chicken tenders traditional dublin gur cake i know you're a big fan of that johnny five lamps oh, lager yeah. and pale ale to be with a chance of winning just tell us which horse won the chanel pharma irish champion hurdle at the Dublin Racing Festival last year. Text your name and answer, send the message to 53106 and we'll contact you after the show. Bear in mind, you have to be over 18 because there's some booze involved as well. Even if you don't win, you can buy a race and graze tasting menu on leopardstown.com before next Wednesday as well. So uh, top quality food to watch the racing with next week. Now, our guest this week is Danny Mullins. Danny, good afternoon to you. How are you? Good afternoon, Jerry. Good afternoon, Johnny. You are in Navan, I believe. I am. I'm locked away in an office here all on my own in Navin, so it won't let me out for another while. Right, that's good. Um, you were actually you were uh, racing today at Navin. What was that like today? Yeah, sure. I suppose it was just very tough. You know, it's uh, it's Navin in January. That's what you're expecting, I suppose. Uh, I finished four to one from my mother earlier, so not a bad old day, and we'll go again. Right, myself and Johnny have both uh, experiences in. I, I covered a club championship football match in the uh, Gaelic Stadium there and the wind howled straight up into it and I definitely felt like it was the coldest place on earth and Johnny said the same thing there's something cold that gets into your bones and Navin that's the rest of the country I don't know what it is yeah it can you know through the winter here there's days it, it gets proper cold but you know it's uh, it's great to be racing or keeping the show on the road I suppose for us now with uh, no showers here I suppose the smell sets in a little bit more <laughs> longer than the cold but that's life during Covid everybody what has to the make their sacrifices there actually in the, with that in that yeah what, what are the what is it, what's it like in terms of can you shower at the track or do you just have to when you go home or what's the story just have to do it when you go home that's been the way from the get go and you know Jennifer Pugh you know she she'll engage with us plenty on it and 
I suppose as sport goes, we've been very strict and it was maybe a little bit more difficult to get used to at the start, but that's a testament to how we've been allowed to keep going, how strict the rules are. And it's a good sign for us going forward. And, you know, we're willing to do whatever we have to do to keep the show on the road. What's that actually been like, that bit where the show has been on the road while the rest of the country has, at various stages, been in complete lockdown and you would uh, venture out and you wouldn't see a soul and then everybody burst out over the course of the summer and it felt like a little bit of normality was returning and then obviously back to a fairly intense lockdown at the minute. All the while you guys have been going about your job and those weird circumstances. What's that been like to live through that? Yeah, I suppose we're just in a bubble where we're racing plenty you know the end of the summer was very busy with a lot of meetings and you know we're riding work in the mornings into the car go racing back home there's probably not been much time to go out and enjoy what would be a normal life so things really haven't changed much for us it's just keep working and keep racing so when you see what other people are going through we're damn glad that we are racing around in an open field and the way our sport is run, that it can operate like it is. And ha at any stage, have you got used to the fact that there aren't supporters, particularly on the big days? Definitely. I suppose the first shock for us was Galway. I found, you know, the, the Galway plate start, it's a great buzz. You're down there right under the stand, so maybe 20,000 people roaring that gallop down to the first fence in Galway is very exciting, where this year we weren't going any slower, but there just wasn't that real bit of tension that a crowd could bring to it. And I suppose from there on, we were getting more used to it. Over Christmas, you know, you have the big festivals in Limerick and Leperstown, and, you know, you'd miss the crowd at those meetings, but we suppose we're used to it at that stage, and we just get on with it. Are there some horses who actually have benefited and some other horses who have not benefited, like actually have suffered by the fact that there isn't whatever happens to them? I, I, I suppose I'm really asking, do you believe crowds have an impact on the horses themselves at some point? Uh, definitely they can. You know, uh, last year I was lucky enough to win the Tiestes on Total Recall and he's a horse that can get very upset before the start. And on the day last year, I just took him down to the start very late to try and keep him as relaxed as I could. Thankfully, he got away while he hadn't blown the lid where, you know, if he was there this year with things just being so more, much more low key, it would have been an ideal day for that type of horse. So there is some benefits and some other horses that are maybe a little bit lazy in that crowd might bring them to life it might have a little bit more adrenaline flowing through them which would mean they're in your hands a little bit more early in a race so it's to and fro i suppose it's a it's a level playing field you know for for the different horses some it benefits some it doesn't what's it is i suppose you've nearly gotten used to it at this stage danny i mean it's been going on so long now as has it been um you know, has it been kind of uh, easy enough to get used to the protocols and, and the, the changes in terms of um, the race day experience? I know a lot of the, probably spend a good bit of time in your car between rides and all that. And um, has ha, have, have the jockeys kind of gotten a bit worn out by it or are they kind of, I suppose, stoically just going along with it and, and happy that they can go racing? Yeah, I suppose it has been very different, but we've just come to accept it. You know, we're very fortunate to be in the position we are and I suppose that goes back to Jennifer Pugh, the IHRB and HRI putting in these strict rules and enforcing them so we're happy enough you know to, to roll with it anything more we're asked to do we we have been doing and you know you're sitting into your car between races you're drowned in wet with muck everywhere you stink but your race and that's what you want to do if you don't want to do it uh, you don't have to as, as we I, I, go on yeah sorry Jerry. Oh, well, i was gonna say as we saw with your cousin last week you obviously do want to do it yeah definitely um yeah you know i i love the game and uh david seems happy enough with his decision uh, i was chatting to him this morning he's still riding out away and you know he's he's starting a new chapter but you know looking back on that if 
any guy walked away from the game with 20 years riding under his belt with the results he'd achieved during his short stint, they'd be more than happy with it. You know, it's uh, he done very well and he's happy and, you know, he had the balls to stand up and make his decision. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And we, we'd, um, we'd got out crack with him actually last week on the show when we were chatting about it. What, what is it for you that makes you love the game? Because, you know, it's a... It's a hard game. You get beaten more often, way more often, than you win. At seven to ten percent success rate is considered, you know, pretty good. So, what is it about this game that gets you up every morning, going, "Yeah, let's go for this"? Yeah, I just love horses. You know, to to deal with animals is something that I've always wanted to do, and the adrenaline of race riding is something I really love. And as you say. The bad days definitely outweigh the good days, but you know, I I just really enjoy those good days, which makes it all the more worthwhile. You know, if you're lying at the back of a hurdle with a horse on top of you, trying to catch your breath and thinking, when am I getting out of this? Uh, there's the days that uh, you'd be questioning it, but you know, I. Yeah, thankfully, uh, I've not had too many bad injuries. I get up, walk away, and you do it again. The, the Were you? Ba- sorry, I said one more question about the bad days. Like, what? How do you deal with them? How do you become accustomed to losing? Is it something that you just need to be able to blink away? And um, what's your process for that? Well, I don't drink, so I normally on a bad day I eat a lot of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> It's, uh, I suppose, as I've got older, when I was younger, if I didn't win, I was maybe more angry with myself. But as I've got older, if I win, lose or draw, once I've given a horse a good ride, I'm happy where going now that I'm a little bit more mature, if I give one a bad ride and still win, I go home a little bit grumpy with myself learn from it and go again and it's likewise if you get beat a head or a half length in a big race but you've given it a great ride to get there i'm satisfied with that where i suppose when you're younger you're not as mature to deal with that that makes sense Mm. what was the thought process behind your decision not to drink was that career related not particularly. I did drink when I was younger, um, probably too young, a uh, little bit bold. I, and, uh, I do remember well, that. I remember, I remember you had a big winner in Galway and I was in the hole in the wall and, and I was looking at you and I was wondering how the hell did that lad get served because I don't know what age he is, but he's he's definitely young. But maybe you weren't, Johnny, maybe you were just tired. Johnny, Johnny, what are you doing? You see, Snitch. You're a, bad, you're a bad reader character because I didn't even drink at that stage. It was after <laughs> there you go. <laughs> older young lad was after winning the Dingle Derby I think it might have been only 15 and I kind of thought I was Frankie Dettori and uh, had a bottle of vodka as good as and passed out I woke up the next day and thought well I didn't really enjoy it that much and if I go out and I don't drink and my friends are good enough to have the crack with I could stay out and have a proper night's fun with the lads, I'm not against drinking, but uh, it just doesn't suit me, and I can enjoy myself without it. Is it something that has been a handicap for some jockeys? Because I like you do hear of um, a lot of jockeys. I suppose you know the you'd often hear all oh, you know it's it's a tough for a young jockey being being reared up the curr and so forth. And um, is is it some is it a danger? We've seen obviously like there has been a fair bit of cocaine use as well, which I suppose that reflects society. But there are dangers for young jockeys out there, and I suppose you did take the sensible approach. Yeah, I suppose young jockeys, it's young people. It's it's all aspects of life. For me, I made my decision and plenty of people, you know, you'd say, oh, you have to drink, you have to do this and you have to do that. Uh, all I felt I had to do was write winners and the rest was uh, enjoy myself. And you're, like, if ever somebody were bred for the job, uh, you are. Was it always... Um... I guess there was very little chance of you being involved in anything other than horses, really, just because you were, you, well, unless you didn't love them, but you probably loved them from day one, I guess. Yeah, I suppose you could say that. And with my pedigree, I'm probably a failure. My mother was a champion lady <laughs> rider and my father was a champion jockey. 
Um, you know, my brother, Anthony, he's two years older than me and he's an agricultural mechanic and he set up his own business with that. So there was never pressure to be a jockey. You know, we, you know, mother and father always in, encourage us to do what we want. I always wanted to go with the horses and Anthony, you know, went to college, got his degree and, you know, he's happy running his own business. When you, was it, uh, when you became yeah. a jockey, was there pressure then? Not really, I suppose. I wouldn't think it was pressure. I'd say it was more support. Right. Uh, like, there's a lot of people there that you can turn to for advice that are in a small circle of people. So you decide how much pressure you want to put on yourself. And, you know... I put plenty of pressure on myself. I, I really enjoy winning. And thankfully, I suppose my talent has brought me to places where I wanted to go. And my discipline and consistency has kept me there. It's the hard work that makes the talent come to the fore. Talent takes you to a point, but that's all. We've seen so many talented people in all sports who don't have the discipline and don't have the hard work and, and don't have that work ethic. You talk about um, the support network you have. Are you good at asking for support and advice? Are you always, um, do you always have a willing ear for it? Because that's, it's hard for a lot of people, particularly when you're young and you have success young, to listen to what people outside are saying. Like, uh, you know, you just always think of what you were like as a late teen, early 20s. Young Irish males tend to be a bit stubborn. Yeah, I suppose, you know, if for me, we'd be riding out in Willie's every morning, myself, David, Emmett, Patrick, Paul Townend, and that'd be there. We wouldn't be afraid to give each other a good dig if you got something wrong. So you, you won't get too big for your boots. <laughs> and if you're wondering about something, you could say, to one of the lads, uh, you know, I suppose a, a perfect example is maybe ground on a day. Myself and Patrick would be riding most days and he'd always walk the track. I'd have a walk before I'd ride most days. And, you know, you're, you're there, simple things like that. You just bounce off each other and, and different ideas. And, you know, some days it might be irrelevant, but it will get you a winner here and there. So to have people with a brain that you can bounce those ideas off is very helpful. And when you were growing up, like, did you feel the pressures of that your parents were feeling in terms of the training of horses or was it, did it come across to you that they really did enjoy the life that they had? Because it is, I mean, we, we've had your dad on, I think he's been one of our more memorable guests really on the show, talk about Princess Zoe, but you, you go through, it's, it's whatever about a jockey, as a trainer, when you have bad years, it is tough and it's like, there's, there, it might be a long time before there is kind of that obvious light at the end of the tunnel as well. Yeah, I suppose, you know, it's, it's a tough business training horses and I think, uh, I remember when I was starting out, uh, my father said to me, keep riding as long as you can, you know, they're the best days of your life. Most people tell you your school days are the best days of your life. For me, being a jockey are the best days of my life. And I have no particular interest in being a trainer. I think I'd make a fine assistant trainer for someone there. There's enough Mullins as training and I <laughs> don't think uh, my name in the lights will do me as a jockey, but a little bit of a help and hand will do me after that. The trainer's life, they deserve every bit of money they make and every bit of success they have where jockeys, you know, we get injured, uh, you recover and you come back where trainers, the, the clock never stops with them. They have to go home every evening, look after horses, keep a business running, look after staff, look after owners, you know, and thankfully I ride for a lot of very good owners and we've great owners around at home. So that definitely makes it easier. But it's a, it's a tough business as a trainer. It's a, not one I'll be jumping into too quick anyway. It, it, it's kind of like a vocation, really, isn't it? Because like, I remember my father would milk cows when I was a kid, and you know, there was the cows just had to be milked. It was as simple as that. And if you didn't, um, you know, if we want to go on holiday, it was it was a big ordeal to get somebody to kind of sit in and and do that for two weeks. But if you're a trainer, like trainers, 
wouldn't be apt to go on on holiday very often because it just can't. It's like it, it is pretty much 24-7. You're up early, you're in, you're in bed, like, you know, after you look at the horses at night and uh, notwithstanding then that actually a lot of them don't necessarily make an awful lot of money, there's, there is a lot going on with it. Definitely, you know, it's funny you say about milk and the cows. I was over at my friend Mark Morrissey's house there the other day and uh, we were, were doing a bit of shooting and we came back in and his, uh, his dad was there with a dairy cow, you know, at 10 o'clock at night and we're giving him a hand, uh, you know, injecting her and doing a few bits uh, to make sure she was okay. But that's the same thing. Like once you have animals, you're, you're on the go where, you know, being a jockey, you go home once you're finished riding and you chill out. What were you shooting incidentally? Uh, we're getting a few rabbits, but I think they were getting a bit better than us the other night. <laughs> to, to, to eat them or? Yeah, you, you could eat them now. I, I wouldn't eat many of them, but we'd, uh, we'd pop away. Yeah, and so the um, in, in turn, just back on the on the training thing, then do you feel that um, like it, 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 people maybe listening to this haven't visited a, a yard, but it is it's a remarkable place because that's the that's the home for the animal and the. The affinity that you develop with the animal then is kind of special that you get to know, it's almost like the pet dog at home or whatever, you get to know his or her quirks and um, they become almost part of you, I suppose. Definitely, you know, like I suppose I'm lucky I've seen both sides of it. Willie's has around probably 200 horses there where my mother or father have, you know, 30, 40 horses in the yard. But you know, the staff get very connected with the horses. We get connected with the horses, you know, jockeys going in and out. And it's a great lifestyle. And I really enjoy the connection with the animals, but like, no doubts it's proper hard work. Danny, how do you uh, unwind? How do you kind of not become completely obsessed by checking on the form of whatever horses you're going up against or the form of horses that you think you're going to be riding over the next while? How do you get away from being 24-7? I like hot chocolate and a bit of Netflix in the evening. That seems to do me. You know, I'm tall enough. I think I'm 5 foot 11, so I, I keep fairly fit. I'd be, you know, doing a bit of exercise during the week and keeping myself taking over. But I suppose you just don't tend to worry about it too much. You get up on race day, you have a look at your races, you see, you know, pace, uh, fancied horses, assess that, talk to your trainer, go out and give the horse the best ride you can. And if you could win every day, it'd be fantastic. But it just doesn't work out like that. And you learn to accept it and go again the next day. And do you have post, if you, if you don't want to be a trainer, do you have a post jockey career plan or a path? Or do you allow yourself to think like that at this stage? Because that might be another way of diverting your attention sometimes? Not particularly, you know, I'd, I've done a few little bits of TV work and that, and, you know, I've a few other things. I've, I've nothing set in stone for myself, but, you know, it's, I say I don't want to be a trainer. That doesn't mean I don't want to be around horses you know the perfect example is david said he didn't want to be a jockey but doesn't mean he's going to walk away from horses you know he'll he'll definitely fit in like that and when the time comes for me i'll find somewhere that i'll fit in as well okay that makes a lot of sense talk to us a little bit about your pony racing career i'm always really interested to see how uh, jockeys reach your level there, there's no it turns out there's no single one pathway for for everybody everybody's story is quite different but you had a lot of success as a pony racer as a as a teenager definitely you know I, I started off you know hunting and show jumping I was lucky enough to ride some very good show jumpers and have quite a bit of success with that and then Barry Fitzgerald was working for my mother when I was only about 14 or that, and uh, his family had a few pony racers, and I, I got going riding those, and I spent two seasons pony racing, I think I rode 126 winners, which, you know, was great experience. You pick up bad habits as well, and I suppose you, you have to iron those out as you go along, and from there, I went to a couple of flat yards 
for the summer when I was only 15 and I ended up going to Jim Bulger's for two weeks one summer and I stayed there for three and a half years. And if you hadn't had a growth spurt, you might have been a flat jockey. Yeah, I suppose, you know, my second or third ride in the Curra, Jim Bulger gave me a lot of good rides when I was young. I think I claimed 10 off 8.4, it was at 7 stone 8, and I was doing that at my ease when I was only 16. And from there, I just, I grew and I grew. I started off, I think I rode 19 winners my first season on the flat. 29 my next and then I was getting heavier uh, very fast and I rode a couple of rides over hurdles that the following season I broke my collarbone my thumb and punched a sound like a fall ended up only riding seven winners on the flat that year and I suppose I with that fall from grace I learned a lot you know you don't take anything for granted in this game and while I wasn't maybe at the weight or size that I am now, I knew my future was lying as a jump jockey. So I had to adjust and... Is there a bit of heartbreak in that, Danny? Just where you you kind of, you can't stop your body doing what it's going to do, it's inevitable, but this thing that you love and you've turned out to be pretty good at is right there for you. There is and there isn't, you know, I suppose it all depends on what way you look at it. You could sit down and feel sorry for yourself. And for me to be reared with jump racing was always something that I enjoyed, where there was a lot of people, lads, girls, riders that have uh, ridden on the flat get too heavy. They don't have a real love for going jumping and they just have no interest in putting up with the punishment that goes with it and that's perfectly fine there's a lot of other good opportunities for those people where i wanted to be a jump jockey and you know when i look back now at my first few rides over hurdles you know i was ordinary worse i'd say terrible and you know it took a lot of adjusting for me where i was a little weedy flat jockey with no muscle, no strength in my legs. I fell off more horses than I should have. And, you know, thankfully, I got going. Barry Connell was very good to me early in my career to give me some of those better opportunities and, and get me off the ground. And, you know, from there, I just kept putting in the hard work and improved with every year. And, Thankfully, I think now I'm riding at the top of my game and, you know, hopefully I have a lot more success in the road ahead. When you say... You talk about strength in your legs as well there. Is, is, what, what are you talking about there in terms of the jump jockey and the strength that he or she will have in his legs that, that comes along with that? Um, and is, is that your kind of... Is it kind of like a squatting position or how do you build that up? Yeah, I suppose... In the last couple of years, I've done a lot more work. Uh, Ruby put me in touch with Enda King up in Santry, and I broke my kneecap, and Enda had got me back in action, and he just made me an awful lot stronger as a person uh, physically to take falls and that, you know, and even when a horse makes a mistake, uh, when you're in that squat position from lifting heavier weights, you know, if a horse uh, hits uh, you, have just a much better suspension system in your legs is probably the best way of describing that. And you're you're tougher when you are hitting the ground that your your body can take an awful lot more punishment. So you're doing squats and, and working out. Did, did, is, was that part of the transformation from flat to jumps? You hadn't been doing that up to that point. I hadn't, and you know, I probably didn't do it enough in the early years riding over jumps, uh, which caught me it wasn't out. Really the culture, I suppose. No, it wasn't, and I suppose things have moved on an awful lot. And I remember the time Ruby was telling me to go up to uh, Enda, and he said to me that one of the good rugby players had put him in touch with him, and he would have loved to have gone up to him ten years earlier himself so there's me 10 12 years younger than ruby i would have been some fool not to take that advice on board and you know 
hopefully in the later years of my career with medical advances and that, it'll give me an awful lot more time at the back end. And make you more adept now, even, are you a better jockey as a result of being stronger and more able to have that good quality suspension system? I suspect the whole point of this is that you are. I don't think I'm a better rider, but I'm a tougher rider. We'll say uh, last year uh, at the Dublin Racing Festival, I think one of my first rides, uh, I went out in the two mile chase and turned head over heels at the first fence, took a fair fall and a fair kick in, and got up, walked away and was in a ding dong finish and got beaten neck at the full of my strength in the very next race, which it didn't make me a better rider going into that day, but it made sure I was as good a rider after getting that fall in the next race on the same day, and you don't have to be a sissy and lie down. Right, it's um, it's pretty amazing that the the difficult you can pinpoint that. In terms of the actual progression then of your own abilities at this point, you know, you said that, you know, coming to the peak of your powers now, how do you continue to get better? Because we've had Barry Garrity on the show and he's, he just talks about, it's just experience and, and scenarios and the kind of almost wargaming exactly where you are, that there was a race this year at Cheltenham that he won that he'd lost previous years, um, obviously last year at Cheltenham that he'd won that he'd lost in previous years. And obviously we know now it was the very end of his career, but he felt like he was still getting better. Yeah, definitely. I suppose Barry hit the nail on the head with that interview. You know, you, you just get a little bit cleverer every day you go. The more you ride the tracks, the more you know them. And even if you're going to a track you haven't ridden before, I'm lucky enough, you know, I get to ride plenty in America and stuff, and you're, you're maybe flying into tracks that you wouldn't have ever seen before, and you can evaluate the situation a lot better. And I suppose a big part of it is riding good horses for good trainers and, you know, owners that have the confidence in you to make those split second decisions. You know, there's always plan A going out in a race, but you have to use your head. You might be going to the first hurdle and something goes completely wrong. And you're when you're that bit more mature, you make the best decision you believe to win the race where you know maybe some younger riders they panic and just ride two or three races to stick to plan a where when you get a bit more mature you do what's best and you learn how to win and how to adapt and then explaining that afterwards is obviously this other important part, downloading the information to make it digestible to both the trainer and then acceptable to the owner who saw that you didn't follow what the instructions were and it finished well or badly. That's the other part of this whole jockey's life that we're still kind of trying to understand from the outside. Yeah, definitely. I suppose your feedback has to be very good and your, your connection with the owners and trainers, that's a, a big part of it. And once you're giving them the correct feedback, they'll have more confidence in you to make the right decision if something does go wrong. And that's grand, is it? Because I, I can imagine if you've come off, you haven't won a race that you feel like you should have, and then there's loads of questions, and you're like, yeah, I mean, obviously I, I tried my best, but uh, you've got to, you know, uh, smile and smile and go, yeah, no, look, yeah, no, fair points, yeah, yeah, no, you're right. Oh, definitely. You know, there's plenty of days you come back into Willie and he'll give you the hair dryer, but you learn and you move on. What's the hair dryer like from Willie? Well, I suppose the, I've heard it described from Alex Ferguson before, and uh, he'll, he'll he'll give it to you too. He'll he'll make you learn and make you better. Right. Okay. We never get to see that in the parade ring. Funnily enough, it's always like, okay, yeah, it's, it's always, yeah, it's yeah. quiet and stoic <laughs> in the parade ring. It's obviously afterwards off Broadway that that happens. Yeah, but you're. There's two ways of looking at that, you know, you, you could sulk over it or you could think you're in a privileged position that you you are getting that information for someone with such uh, intelligence and held in such high esteem in the game. Yeah, no, totally. And so what you're telling us is that you don't get a free ride because you share a surname. No, definitely not. We, we work for everything and, you know, um, 
thankfully we we deserve everything we get but you you have to keep working you know, as well as we touched on earlier success is rented you stop paying the rent uh, you get kicked out you obviously work with loads of different um, trainers and loads of different owners how how do you plot out a career plan from this this point like what's how do you define success in a short term period and then look to build on that so that the next couple of years you you constantly feel like your your career is progressing and not just that you're getting better or fitter yeah i suppose you know everybody would love to be champion jockey but uh i'm not in a position at the moment uh to uh have a go at a championship so for me, you know, I like to try and ride a grade one winner every year. And thankfully, you know, I've, I think I've ridden 10 grade ones so far and ridden a lot of those big races. So they're a very important part of the season. And, you know, then, you know, through the summer and that, uh, I, I ride a lot of winners uh, for John Ryan. He's, you know, a smaller family run operation similar to my mother and father's and to ride those winners for for the smaller teams is great as well so it's not there's no specific mapped out plan of what success would look like in 2021 2022 2023 not particularly you know you i suppose you have to write to the best of your ability take all the opportunities that come and make the most of them uh, i suppose it's about getting on the good horses and giving them their best chance to win and hopefully someday when somebody else makes a decision a little bit wrong you can get the horse who might be the best horse in the race to win and that that part of the game is the other fascinating part that we've we've dealt with a little bit where we kind of um talk about the role of the agent and all this you need your agent to be out there kind of saying look you know you guys need to have this man on your horse right now he's on fire yeah, definitely. You know, Ken Whelan is my agent and Ken does a great job. You know, he's he's trying to get you on the best horse in every race and then it's up to you after that. Yeah, how 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 is Ken keeping actually? It's, these are the people that I, I guess the likes of me just don't meet anymore. Yeah, he's in great form. You know, we were chatting every day, every second day and, you know, he he's busy away. He'd still write out the odd lot early in the morning and he'd be back in the office then doing all the hard work behind the scenes to put us in the position that we are in. I suppose the one thing as well, with, with David's calling the quits, it does free up a few rides from Willie's that, you know, the likes of you might just fall upon as well and there are opportunities there. Yeah, definitely. You know, uh, I suppose myself and David, the last couple of seasons would have always been pitted against each other. And if he was riding better than me, he might get better rides than me. Or if Willie, you know, thought I was riding better, I might rub a few rides on him. And David's retired now. There's going to be somebody else there that's, you know, there's plenty of other good riders. Brian Hayes is riding a good bit for Willie now, and he's having the season of his life too. So things won't change a whole lot for me. You know, it's always going to be stiff competition. So when you're... When, when, oh, sorry, I was going to just... When, when you're all... Good, so, yeah. Go on. When is a good time to retire, uh, Danny? And, like, I know that might sound like a daft question, but, like, you don't want to go out where the race course chat is kind of, like, that lad should have retired two, three years ago. But at the same time, you obviously want to maximise the time that you have there. And uh, is it dependent on, basically, how many bones you've broken at that stage or, or, or what is this whole process? Yeah, I suppose it's uh, how much more punishment your body can take and how much longer in your mind you want to risk it uh, I think a good age would be 45 with modern medicine but most people laugh at me when I say that but right. I, I you reckon 45 old. yeah I get to 45 yeah 19 more years that's not bad it's uh, plenty, of, plenty of winning and losing to be done in the meantime text in from Johnny P wondering who's the worst loser of all the Mullins Well, none of us enjoy losing. <laughs> Come on, no. Uh, They're very diplomatic. Emmett is very stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's fair enough. What, what about your, your dad and your mother? Like, Which of them takes a beating uh, better? 
I suppose do, do, do. neither of them like getting bet, but uh, I think my mother might take a little bit better. Right, and and I suppose on that, then my final question is: What was it like for your father? Or what did you feel in terms of just the year he's had? Like when he when he was on with Princess Zoe, I don't know. It was probably I think it was the, my favorite show that we've had so far, just talking about horses and his life with the horses. But to come upon her and what she did our weekend, it's it's I don't know. It, it kind of justifies why you're in the game, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. You know. To see the joy she brought him through the year was unbelievable. You know, he's, he's done it all really through his training and riding career, champion jockey, trained winners in Cheltenham, had good years, had very quiet years. And to get a horse like that to bounce back and put him at the peak of the flat game, you know, you can come across a good jumper, but to get a horse to run to that level on the flat is an unbelievable achievement where very few people will equal that. You know, to bring her from running actually here in Navin off 64 to win the Group 1 on Arc Weekend, you know, if she was to get from 64 to win the Premier Handicap, it would have been a serious achievement, let alone win on one of the biggest weekends in the flat calendar that's that takes us serious doing yeah it's hollywood secretariat type stuff um look what what's your weekend like we're, we're nearly done here but what what kind of a weekend have you got lined up i have a couple of rides are we nason fairy house saturday and, and sunday uh declarations were finalized for the morning so i'll actually chat to ken on the way home i haven't looked at the weekend just yet so i'll see get a look at those races and try and get on another winner or two. With the Dublin Racing Festival next weekend and then obviously Cheltenham to look forward to and then uh, after that you've got the uh, Punchstown. It's like this next eight weeks, 12 weeks are like essentially I guess the best 12 weeks of the year where the big races are coming thick and fast and everything really matters. Yeah, definitely. You know, this is a time of the year you want to be winning some of those good races and thankfully, you know, I've had a great few weeks the last couple of weeks and long may continue hopefully get some more winners Danny good it stuff it should be just said on, Jared, yeah. before we before we finish it, like I know Princess always been great and all Danny but will it actually be enough to make your father get over the loss of all these preview nights for Cheltenham that he's the star of the show at every year I I think he'll manage that he's is not great on the technology but he's getting a handle on the <laughs> the Twitter and the Zoom and that, so I don't think they'll keep him away from that. And what Princess Zoe has done from, I think uh, it'll be very difficult to match that. Good stuff, Danny. Thanks a million. Cheers. Thanks, Danny. Catch you soon. Danny Mullins giving us some thoughts there. If uh, you want to get in touch with us, of course, you can text the show on the even 53106. Uh, Friday Night Racing on Off the Ball is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. Just put... put Danny's uh, status in some context for us, Johnny, at the moment. Obviously, we, we keep looking for the leaders of that next new generation who are coming through. He's right there, right? He is right there, yeah. And actually, like just as we're talking now, I'm just going to look up the, the stats for the season because um, there, is a, there is a gap, there. I've spoken about this a few times, that those um, jockeys that have retired and um, the, the end of the golden generation, uh, you know, there, there's definitely space for... For the likes of Danny to kind of come through, and you know, now that David is gone as well, um, you know, it's 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 there's definitely it's I don't want to say it's not a golden generation of jockeys, but it's it's not maybe the absolute vintage kind of set of jockeys that we would have had in the past yet. But there's so much talent out there. Paul Town and his leading Rachel Blackmore at the moment, um, and Sean Fannigan's having a good season, which I guess Jack Kennedy, who's had his injuries. Mark Walsh in fifth. There you're talking about the top jockeys. Danny and then David would be sort of down between the 15 and the 20. And um, Danny this season um, would be on 19 winners. So up from 242 rights. He's getting a lot, lots of mounts. I suppose people would remember his time with um, Barry Connell. And, um, you know, he came through that. That, that, that was a very high-profile job. 
Um, I'm, I'm not really sure the, the days of the, the owner having a jockey. I, I think they might be a little bit behind us because I, I think it's kind of pointless in a way. I think stable jockeys are one thing, but riding for an owner um, on the flat or in national hunt race, and I don't really get it anyway. But Danny's a very good rider. Um, he's a very good talker about the game as well. And it was interesting to hear that he wouldn't necessarily want to go training because I don't think he'd be a prisoner to that. And uh, yeah, he's just, a, you know, a, a jockey who's had a very good career and um, very, very strong on a horse as well. And um, it, it probably did take a bit of time to be to make that transition from flat to national hunt. But um, I do remember him being a seriously talented young rider as well on the flat uh, until Wake got in his way. And um, he, the fact that he doesn't drink, I think, will probably help him to um, maybe get the most out of his career or at least extend it because, you know, it'll just it'll just keep him focused in terms of, of, of what the, the job is at hand. And he has been relatively okay injury-wise as well. So very, very good rider. Yeah, to touch well on that. And obviously, like a decade and a half for us to look forward to of him uh, riding big winners in big races as well. So there's just, there was supposed to only be one horse lining up in our tote tend to follow for the Irish Inter Jockeys Fund this weekend. I'm still trailing you by 16 points, which isn't bad considering you're like a professional who does this all day, every day, for your job and you know I'm just a Johnny come lately Paisley Park obviously down to run at Cheltenham on Saturday but Cheltenham is off as we've said so um, uh, the Dublin Racing Festival is ultimately going to decide this this race for us next weekend uh, you can get the tote price guarantee on all Irish and UK races this week on tote.ie it is a pity that uh, Cheltenham's off yeah, it's it's just a shame because obviously the the, the race track, you know, Chel Cheltenham got a lot of slagging last year, like, but that that obviously wasn't Cheltenham's doing. And I mean, the the loss of I don't know what's going to happen with the festival this year. Obviously, there will be racing, um, but I mean, at the moment, the crowd looks it just looks so. Even though it's only in March, it just seems like it's so far off. So it's tough times for Cheltenham and the loss of that meeting as well. It obviously focuses our attention on Nace and Fairy House. There is good racing elsewhere in Britain tomorrow, but. Um, that would have been good, good, a good uh, meet at Cheltenham. One of my horses, the big getaway, he's out for the season, uh, Ger, which won't help my cause. Will give you some sort of a chance, but Dublin Racing Festival will tell a lot. Basically, a scatter of those horses running, it's going to be great. So, all right, we'll talk about it plenty next week on the show. Uh, in the meantime, Johnny, go well. Thanks a million. Thanks, Ger. That's for this week's Friday Night Racing, brought to you in association by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. We'll see you next Friday afternoon, bang on three o'clock on all our social channels. Until then, take care. Friday Night Racing. On Off The Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie.